one of the one of the most unique things I saw get deducted um, or keep someone from getting uh, their SSI check was that uh, this person had purchased a burial plot and Social Security counted that as an asset. Like you can resell this, um, you know, and then folks hit me up and well, well, what they're counting my 401k and my IRA. I can't cash that out. But Social Security is like, yes, you can. You're just going to get massive tax consequences on it. And it's considered an asset. So because it's cash or can be liquidated to cash. Um, and it, it's an, and so remember, SSI is a needs based program. Good morning, Izzy. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Peter? Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, no, I'm great. Um, for those who haven't watched your prior uh, interviews and podcasts, um, let me introduce you. This is Isabella Baez, who is an attorney uh, in our firm, uh, who really has done, um, and I kind of focusing on uh, federal appeals uh, in the United States District Court, but you've also done a ton of hearings at this point. Um, you're a graduate from the University of North Carolina Law School. You uh, reached out to me and uh, even before you had taken the bar and started working for our firm, gosh, has it been four, three? About three years. Three years, um, uh, about three years ago. So you've been working for the firm about three years, which is great. And um, and you've come so far and learned so much and just, uh, uh, you know, not in any way condescending. I'm just so proud of all the knowledge you picked up and, uh, and how much you care. Cause I know you care deeply, um, about not only the clients at Evans and Evans or Evans disability, uh, but just the disabled community. Um, uh, and so. I think that really shines through uh, in your interactions with clients and your um, interactions with uh, folks at our firm and uh, and how you approach your work. So uh, I'm very proud to have you be a, a member uh, at our firm and working at our firm and all that good stuff. So thank you because it's very uh, kind words. You're going to blow my head up a little bit. <laughs> well, good, good. Um, well, listen, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today that I thought, um, you know, maybe we could outline for, you know, folks that maybe just are approaching Social Security disability for the first time and maybe approaching uh, applying for the first time. And I think there's a perception out there that, gosh, I'm disabled for whatever reason. Maybe it's your back, your neck, you know, maybe it's a mental health issue. But for whatever reason, I'm disabled and I'm going to go down to Social Security. I'm going to apply for Social Security disability and, you know, and here I'm disabled and you should give me uh, my month to month payment or whatever else I'm entitled to. And I think that is a common perception amongst when I talk to friends or friends of friends or family, my own family. They're like, oh, I didn't realize, you know, there's more to it than that. Right. And as you and I both know, there are, not only do you have to be disabled, but there are technical aspects in which we're going to dive into what that means here in a minute, but there's technical aspects to what you might also, what disability program are you eligible for? Right. And a lot of people are like disability program, isn't there just one, you know, and and they and then and then they confuse the names. Oh yeah, I know about SSI or SSDI. I just thought that was kind of all the same thing, and it's not. Um, and one of the things I want to do today is I want to talk about the five disability programs within Social Security uh, that are out there for the disabled. And the definition of disability. Um, is fairly generally the same, at least in four of the five programs, uh, child's disability is defined differently. But of the five programs, I want to talk about what are the technical requirements that might make you eligible for one or even more than one of the programs. And then maybe a little bit at the end, we can talk a little bit about how they interact together because you can 
you're not just limited to applying for one. In fact, I've seen people apply for three of the five or four of the five or, you know, generally. But and being that you're our residential, you know, uh, Social Security disability guru, uh, I wanted to chat with you about it um, and kind of go through each of those five programs, you know, and and we uh, will have a podcast that talks about disability and we talk about medical records and, you know, having all of that, but really kind of going through each program um, today. And so there are, and, and frankly, the most popular program, there's really two of them that are super, super popular that I mentioned in our introduction here, and that's SSI and SSDI. And perhaps, you know, and I wanted to chat with you uh, uh, about each program. So maybe we can talk about SSDI first, which uh, stands for Social Security Disability Insurance Benefits, um, also commonly referred to as DIB or DIB disability insurance benefits and what are some of the technical requirements or the the legal requirements to be eligible for that program sure peter so like you were saying ssa has an entire requirement for being disabled um and that has to do with your medical records and everything but then there's this whole other part that ssa tends to look at first um, which is based on these technical eligibility requirements. Um, and for the disability insurance benefits program, um, there are technical requirements um, that you work a certain amount um, and pay into the system, basically paying through taxes um, for the Social Security Administration program itself. And so basically the biggest technical requirement for disability insurance benefits program is what's called Porter's Credits. You can hear this, you know, flying around the internet, um, different podcasts as just credits, work credits, things like that. But basically, they're essentially units that just measure your work history. Um, and again, you know, financial contribution to the social security system. And you basically earn them um, just based on your annual income and the number of credits um, needed basically um, depends on your age, um, and severity of disability as well. So if you have enough work credits to be eligible for the disability insurance benefits program, um, SSA will then consider you to be what's called fully insured, which is kind of like having, if you want to kind of compare it to having car insurance, basically you kind of go in to a car insurance company, right? And you go and buy car insurance and your money goes into a pool. Um, this large pool, and then if it ever comes a time where, you know, your car needs to be serviced or you have an accident, you can basically then pull out of that pool and then you'll be covered. It's a little bit similar with the Social Security program um, in that, you know, you're putting in during your whole life and then you can take out when you need it. So um, for work credits, um, basically there are a few things that will affect whether you have enough um for being fully insured under this disability insurance benefits program um and you might see around the internet too that you need about you know um 20 quarters within the past 10 years to be eligible um but that's only for certain age brackets it's not exactly true for everyone so that's kind of why today we're going to dive a little deeper into um parsing that out for um specific individuals um, and again, so there are two different things here that can affect your insured status, and that's one, your age, and then two is also when exactly did you earn your credits? Was it recent enough to be considered fully insured as well? And so generally, Peter, you know, the younger you are, the fewer credits that you need to qualify. Um, and you must also, though, like I just said, have earned your credits recently enough um, before coming disabled as well. So just for clarification purpose, let me interrupt you. Just for clarification purposes, the disability insurance benefit program is for adults. Generally, you have to be over 18, um, and we're not talking about children's uh, uh, that, and I'm, and I'm not speaking about a dependent children whose parents found disabled. I'm just t talking about if you are applying for your own disability program. You have to be an adult, which is over the age of 18, 
and typically you're under the full retirement age. So it's somewhere in that range. Um, and a work credit is one, you earn one credit per quarter. And that's when you're speaking to 20 credits out of 10 years, generally speaking. Uh, and again, it breaks down to different age brackets, what you're about to explain. You earn one credit per quarter, which is, you know, January through March is a quarter. So the max credits you can earn in a year is four. And so when you're talking about 20 credits, that's generally speaking five years out of 10 years or 20 credits out of 40. And my understanding and um, is that it doesn't always have to be, you can have little gaps in there as well. It doesn't have to be a consecutive five, like back to back to back to back five years in a row. You can work for a year, take a few, you know, take a six months off or a year off, work for another year, you know, and sort of alternate how you earn those credits. Uh, generally speaking, 20 out of 40. Um, but no, I'm really interested in how it breaks down at the age category. Yeah, um, I'll talk a little bit about that and just to kind of build off of what you were saying as well. So um, basically it is based on quarters. That's why they're technically called quarter credits. And you can only obviously earn four per year since there are only four credits in a year. Um, and in order to actually earn a credit, what you have to do is actually earn um, an annual income in 2024 of at least seventeen hundred and thirty dollars. So one thousand seven hundred thirty dollars will earn you one credit um, within a quarter. So seventeen hundred and thirty dollars in that quarter, not per month, and that's gross income, not net. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's one big thing about the earning of the credits. Um, going back to the age differences, though, um, like you said, generally, if you earn 20 credits within the last 10 years, that's kind of what you hear going around the internet. Um, but again, you know, if you're 18 to age, you know, your retirement age, there are different age bracket requirements, um, which can make it a little easier for people who are younger. So um, for people who are 24 and under, Generally, you only need six credits um, earned within the past three years um, to be considered fully insured. So basically, that means um, the six credits, what we had just said, um, means six quarters where you had earned $1,730. So that's for people 24 and under. And then there's also the age category of 24 to 30. Um, so typically, this gets a little more complicated. Um, but you need credits for half of the time between age 21 and how old you are when you became disabled. So, for example, if you became disabled at age 29, um, then you would need credits for half of those eight years between age 21 and 29. So that's four years worth of credits, which equals 16 credits. That makes sense. Okay, and then going on to the next age category, um, that's age 31 through 42. This group is what you generally hear. Um, this is you need the 20 credits earned within the past 10 years um, before your disability. So that's kind of like the general rule one. And then once you hit 43 to 61, this group kind of follows the same math as the previous category, um, but just adds an extra credit for every year after the age of 42. So that means um, at age 44, um, you would need 20 credits plus two for the two years between age 44 and 42. So you'd need a total of 22 credits if you're 43 to 61. And then lastly, the last age category is 62 and up. So basically anyone um, 62 um, to six, usually 67 is most people's um, retirement age or whatever your retirement age is. Full um, retirement age, yeah. Correct, your full retirement age. Um, you need 40 credits earned within the past 10 to 15 years um, before your disability. So those are kind of how um, the fully insured status work um, for those different age categories. So it's a little bit different depending on your age. Yeah, no, and that's great. Uh, thank you for breaking down the age categories. And a lot of this were, um, you know, we sort of know, but 
also we take it directly from Social Security and uh, get the information from the the uh, their rules and regulations. One thing I just wanted to make for clarification, especially if you're self-employed out there, is that for disability insurance benefits, you need to pay into Social Security tax or FICA, which is different than paying the IRS. It is so a lot of times people will say, oh, I pay taxes, I pay taxes, and then they pay directly to the IRS. Of course, they should, and especially if they're self-employed. Um, but then the question is, is, well, did you pay into Social Security? Did you pay into FICA? It is a separate thing. You, yeah. If you're a W-2 employee, meaning you have an employer that pays you a paycheck and withholds your taxes for you, you should uh, see the breakdown. We paid, you know, the IRS X amount of money of your paycheck, and then you'll see we pay FICA or Social Security another amount of money. And it's that FICA Social Security amount uh, that shows that you are paying into uh, Social Security to earn those credits, like like we talked about. Right. So, so it's really for self-employed folks that will approach us and be like, no, I paid taxes for years and years and years. And I'm like, but did you pay into Social Security? And sometimes, you know, the answer always right. comes back a little bit different. Right. And Peter, that's such an important distinction to just not only for self-employment folks, but also for people who work for employers who, um, you know, certain states have some rules on employers and whether they need to contribute. Um, their employees need to contribute to the Social Security program itself, and some do not. Um, and some people kind of go their lives working under a certain employer, just not knowing that, that they're putting into state taxes, but not federal taxes. So again, you know, SSA disability is a federal program. Um, so usually you can see it on your pay stub or ask your employer. Um, it's pretty important to know whether um, you are putting into the social security system for disability. Right, right. So what else should we tell our uh, tell folks about this program that you think might be important, disability insurance benefits or SSDI? Sure. So let's say that you've been found technically eligible, right? For SSDI, you, you're fully insured based on your credits on the quarters that you've been working. Um, that does not um, stand forever. Those work credits do not last forever and they do expire. So basically you have what's called a date last insured. Um, and they will basically have your quarter credits. SSA will consider them to be expired five years from the last working date. So basically, if you become disabled, you're not able to work anymore. Um, then you have five years to then basically apply to the disability insurance benefits program um, before your insurance coverage um, kind of ends. So I can go a little deeper into that as well. No, yeah, no, that's great. And the date last insured, so generally speaking, because, you know, there's always different cases out there that we see and the date last insured kind of changes, depends on when you last paid in, but also like when you last paid in consistently. So maybe, and I just want to, for clarification purposes, if you have a question about your date last insured, Social Security will have it. So you can sometimes create a MySSA.gov account and then go see your date last insured. You can always pick up the phone or go down to your local office and ask them um, or, you know, consult with a lawyer and then we can ask them for you as well if you become one of our clients. The thing about that, you know, what I'll see sometimes is people will say, oh, I work consistently from for four years in a row and then I took five years off and worked one month, or maybe I took four years off and I worked one month or two months, but didn't really make that much money. Why is not my date last insured from that date when the date last I last paid in? So what I generally will say is it's from the date you last paid in on a really consistent basis at that, you know, in 2024 is that $1,700 mark or more. And so it's not just like, oh, I sporadically worked and then I last paid in. And then why isn't it that date triggered? Um, so it, it's hard cause it's this massive math calculation that's done by social security the date last insured bit. And if you'd like to dive in a little bit more, that'd be great. 
Sure. So um, let's say, you know, your credits have expired um, and you can technically, like you were saying, you can kind of go back to work um, as well. And um, basically, if you feel like you had been disabled for a while, but not 12 months, which is one of the medical requirements, and then you go back to work um, later, you can basically um, go and try to earn more credits um, like you had just said, and so that you'll be fully insured and able to then apply for that program. So that's kind of one of the other parts of your date last insured. It really has to do with, you know, again, when you're earning these credits, when you're applying for disability, and again, your age bracket. Yeah. So let me, for just clarification purposes too, for uh, our listeners, with the date last insured, one of the things that's so to be eligible for the money in which you paid into social security you have to be your your established onset date must be while you're insured okay so for example if your date last insured is march 31st of 2024 okay and and you haven't worked for let's say five years or six years and you're now coming to us and saying hey look Actually, better yet, let's say it's December 31st of 2023, and today is February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day, by the way. Uh, today is February 14th of 2024, uh, and your date last insured is two months ago, and you haven't applied for Social Security yet. It doesn't mean you're not eligible. What it means is is we need to get your your uh, application for disability insurance benefits going you know, fairly quickly, and most cases, as you know, we just saw 2023 numbers, I would say based off of Social Security's own numbers, about 60% of these cases will go to hearing. Mm -hmm. So if you're the so the majority of the Social Security applicants go to hearing, and that's about a three-year process, give or take. But you're like, Pete, I was my date last insured was three years ago, and now we're 2027, right? And I'm like, yes, but all we have to prove is that you were disabled while you were insured. And even though it's three years later and that insurance date didn't get extended, as long as the judge or Social Security Administration finds you disabled before your date last insured, so your established onset date, you're good. And it's a lot like a car accident because a lot of uh, like car insurance, because like I love that as an example um, with date last insured as well. With car insurance, most people who pay into car insurance, we fully expect that if you stop paying into car insurance, you become uninsured, right? And you might pay once every six months, but you generally we all accept, even if I paid for car insurance since I was 16 years old, right? And now I'm 48 years old and I've never once used it. But then I decide, you know what? To be good on the environment. I'm just going to walk and ride my bike from now on. And then I do that for six, seven months. And then I'm like, man, it's really, you know, up here, it's really wet and rainy. So let me jump into my car and I'm just going to drive to work and I get in an accident. And guess what? I'm not insured because I haven't paid it in the last six or seven months. And then they call me and say, I paid it for 40 years. I paid it since I was 16 years old. How come I'm not insured? That's not fair. And then I'll say, it, you got to think of it as insurance. Did you make that last premium check? That last premium payment into your insurance? Because if you didn't, then now you're uninsured. But if you got in a car accident while you were insured, it's covered. And while you're not insured, it's not covered. So um, so I love the car uh, car example for date last insured uh, with the car insurance. Yeah. Because I think generally people think, man, I've paid into this for 40 years. How come I'm not insured? I just didn't pay in the last six or five. Uh, and if you think of it as an insurance program, that's sort of where uh, you end up. So uh, there's one other uh, program I want to cover in part one of this uh, two part series. But in part one, I wanted to also talk to you about SSI, which is far different 
than SSDI. And I think they get confused a lot. So that's why I wanted to talk about them together. What is SSI? What does it stand for? And what are some of the basic requirements? Sure. So this is completely different, like you said, from the Disability Insurance Benefits Program. We're going to separate here from talking about work credits because SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income, is not based on work credits whatsoever. Um, this is basically a program for people with disabilities with certain um, asset limits um, and basically is kind of like a security net for those with disabilities who um, don't have a certain amount of assets. So as for the technical requirements, um, it basically relies heavily on financial need. Um, and if for a non-married individual in particular um, in 2024 to meet the technical requirements for eligibility, your total countable assets, which includes both earned and unearned income, cannot exceed $2,000. And then for a couple, um, married partners, spouses, it's also a legal marriage, their countable assets, which again is both earned and unearned income, um, must not exceed $3,000. So those are kind of the basic technical requirements um, for being eligible for SSI, which again, accompany the medical requirements. Right. What? And and just for clarification, once you're 65 or older, you don't have to prove disability for SSI. So for SSI, just like SSDI, um, you know, you're eligible for it until your full retirement age. Uh, at 65 or older, uh, you can also be if you meet the technical financial requirements for SSI, you can take it uh, take SSI at 65 or older. Under 64 or under, you have to prove disability. What are, um, and just for clarification, we talked about, you know, they look at this 3,000, 2,000 uh, in assets. What, how do we define assets generally speaking? Sure. So in the context of SSI, assets can include a variety of things. So that can include cash bank accounts, stocks, um, but also other resources that can basically be converted into cash to support your basic needs. Um, so it's pretty crucial to understand as well what I had mentioned earlier, the difference between earned and unearned assets as well. So assets, um, basically, those are what you receive as a result of work or employment. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, wages or like we were kind of talking about with the disability insurance benefits program, self-employment income would count as earned assets as well. Now, unearned assets, on the other hand, encompass things like gifts, inheritance, um, financial assistance you've received um, that isn't tied to work. Um, so things like that. So those are basically the two differences and kind of what an asset is. Um, and there's a large list of things that SSI will consider um, to be a countable asset. Um, but there's also a list of exceptions as well. So for example, SSI and SSA, they're not going to count the home you live in um, if you own it against you um, and the property that it's on. Again, if you own it, um, they're not going to count against you one vehicle um, that you have. Um, and then basically those are the kind of things that, you know, the generally most common things that they're not going to count against your countable assets for SSI eligibility requirements. Yeah, no, that's great. There is a very specific list. And in this context where we're sort of generally talking, and I'm using this word generally a lot, uh, intentionally, uh, it's because, you know, we're not giving specific legal advice in this podcast to anyone in particular. We're just talking about sort of general information um, and some, you know, behind the scenes insights that we've seen in different cases along the way. And, you know, fortunately, I've been in thousands and thousands and thousands of cases at this point uh, and hearings. Um, but how I kind of generally explain assets, it's basically cash or anything that can be liquidated to cash. Right. And then with, earned or unearned income or an asset or however you want to say it, unearned income in a lot of ways, you got to think about things like VA benefits. That's a popular one amongst uh, disability clients that will approach us 
uh, looking for SSI, maybe spousal support, child support, um, things like that. When we talk about vehicles, we're not just talking about cars. We're also talking about, man, what about that broken down motorcycle in your garage? Or what about um, that four wheeler in your backyard? Or, um, uh, you know, in some cases I've seen people say, gosh, I have a fishing boat that's so old, but it's titled in my name. And all of that's, you know, is fair game too for SSI. And in the simplest of terms for SSI, supplemental security income, it is a needs-based program in a lot like food stamps or uh, HUD housing or general housing or uh, Medicaid. Um, it's a need-based program for the disabled through the Social Security Administration. It's for people generally who haven't worked and paid into Social Security enough to trigger being eligible for SSDI. One of the, one of the factors for SSI when you apply is that one of the requirements is that you go apply for every uh, disability program within Social Security that you may be eligible for. So they'll make you apply for SSDI just to make sure you're not insured. Or if you're not quite fully retired, but you're under the full retirement or full retirement age, so early retirement, they'll make you apply for retirement as well because they want to make sure you're pulling from every potential resource before they pay you out on SSI. SSI uh, is funded through the general tax fund as well. It's not funded through Social Security. So there's a lot of different, um, you know, opinions on that. And I don't want to, I don't want to get into any of that. But, you know, generally SSI is funded that way as well. So that's why I think there's all these requirements to kind of, for a needs-based program that they really look at, are you financially eligible? But it is far different than SSDI. Right, right. And kind of like you were saying, um, if you got that old motorcycle in your garage um, or something like that, you're thinking about it, um, it's really important to contact, you know, either an attorney or kind of do some research online on the Social Security website on exactly what exactly is considered an asset. Um, but most of the time that you can kind of consider anything any property that you own, if you can't use it, you can't sell it, SSA generally won't count that against you. So, I mean, if that old motorcycle is worth nothing, it doesn't work, you can't sell it, then they're not going to count that against you. But if that's something you can, you know, sell off, like you said, convert it into cash, then you basically have to stay under those limits that were set for an individual, which again is $2,000, and then a married couple, which was $3,000. And you know, Peter, if if you do happen to, for a month or two, you get a gift from someone, um, you go over the asset limit, it's not going to immediately mean that you're going to be ineligible for all SSI benefits. Um, there are what called deductions. Um, there are months where SSI can say, hey, you know, you went over the asset limits, we're not going to pay you this month. But then it's completely possible the next month to kind of get back on benefits if you go back under that asset limit. One of the one of the most unique things I saw get deducted um, or keep someone from getting uh, their SSI check was that uh, this person had purchased a burial plot, and Social Security counted that as an asset. Like you can resell this, um, you know. And then folks hit me up and well, well, what they're counting my four hundred one k and my IRA. I can't cash that out, but. Social Security is like, yes, you can. You're just going to get massive tax consequences on it, and it's considered an asset. So, because it's cash, it can be liquidated to cash. Um, and it, it's an and so remember, SSI is a needs based program. That's yes, Um, Well, listen, I think we're going to wrap up part one here, and um, I'm really grateful for your time. And then we'll take a small break, and then get into part two to talk about the other three programs. All right. Well, sounds great. Thanks for having me, Peter. For sure.